Hello everyone, I'm Jim Staley, Passion for Truth Ministries, and welcome to today's broadcast. Let me ask you a question. Do you know what real repentance really is? It's the one thing we all need to have great relationship with both God and man, fulfilling the first and second commandment, but it's the one thing that most of us have been taught wrong about. We're going to discover what the Hebrew word teshuvah means right after this. All right, again, my name is Jim Staley, and I'm excited about this particular topic. This is a difficult topic, without a doubt. It's a topic that runs its way through the entire Bible. It runs all the way through every relationship that we have. Most of our relationship problems can be traced right back to this one single Hebrew word, which we're going to break down deeply in this broadcast. It's called Teshuvah. And uh, when we're dealing with teshuvah, which is the English word repentance, uh, which really is more better translated as return, we really need to know what it means, what it looks like. When we're dealing with teshuvah, in a Hebrew mindset, someone would say, oh, you're in the month of Elul. The month of Elul is the sixth month on the religious calendar. It's the last month on the civil calendar, right before the Hebrew New Year, and it is most commonly traditionally known for preparing for your maker to come. It's preparing for the bridegroom. It's that wedding idea of before you get married, clean up everything in your life, get ready because the Messiah is about to come. And what would you do if you knew the Messiah was coming 30 days from now? You would most certainly be cleaning up your life and doing a lot of teshuvah. You'd be doing a lot of repenting and a lot of returning back to God and the month of Elul is that time where on God's calendar, God's people begin to really introspectively look inside. And so what I want to teach you in this broadcast is I want to teach you what does it mean to actually repent? What is real biblical repentance look like? Because in my almost 50 years of existence, I have rarely seen it even in my own life. It's so difficult. And so I'm going to give you four steps for repentance and what it really looks like to make relationships great in your life again, all right? This is all about looking into what you could have done differently in the last year. It's introspection. It's, it's God, what can I do differently next year that will put me in a better relationship both with you vertically and with man horizontally? Also, we want to look at the challenges that you overcame and the challenges that you need to overcome in the, in the next year. You might need to look at people that you need to ask forgiveness for or people that, need, that you need to go to and let them know that you're offended. Don't hold any offense any longer. This moment, this time of teshuva is all about returning to that beautiful, clean slate uh, that you were born with before you begin to figure out how to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, that's where we're trying to get to and clean it all out. Anything that's in that's inside of you that you're holding on to, uh, uncork that bottle, get rid of it, confess it, deal with it, so that when the maker comes, he doesn't have to deal with it. It's all about like two kids that are fighting, uh, and they know that by the time they get home, they're going to have to deal with dad. They better get it worked out amongst themselves before dad uh, arrives on the scene. And, and that is kind of a, a silly word picture that we as believers and sheep in Christ, as children of the Most High God, we need to get our acts together. And repentance is the number one thing that we need to learn how to do because I believe it's the number one thing that's preventing us from having deeper walks with God and with one another. All right. In short, it's all about preparing for the Messiah, as I mentioned already. Uh, another customary thing that's important to know is it's customary every day during the month of Elul, leading up to uh, Yom Teruah, the blowing of the trumpets, or today is traditionally called Rosh Hashanah, it's, tr it's traditional to blow the shofar. Now, why the shofar? Because the shofar is the sound of war. It's, it's a awakening call. Uh, in, in ancient Israelite Hebrew religion, they would blow it uh, on, on, the, on the Sabbath to say, hey, this is a time of celebration. They would blow it. The watchman on the wall would blow it during the time of, hey, the enemy is coming. We need to gather the troops together. They would do it on the feast day. So anything that's truly extraordinarily important, they would blow that shofar or that ram's horn. And so because this is a preparation for the coming of the Messiah, it's traditional to blow a shofar. If you have a shofar, 
I encourage you to do that. It is absolutely will wake you up, especially if you're not very good at blowing it. It will for sure wake your neighbor up. Uh, but in all uh, honesty, it is a beautiful sound that is unique to all other sounds on earth. And I believe that's why uh, the Bible says that at the sound of the trumpet, which is the ancient shofar, the dead in Christ will rise first. It's also traditional to read from Psalm 27. I'm not going to read it. I want you to read it. I think it's absolutely amazing chapter of repentance. If you have anything in your heart that you need to repent of, Psalm 27 will guide you through that process. Tell me what you think in the comments. If you think it's as good as I think uh, that it is for repentance, I'd be really curious what your thoughts are. Uh, leave it in the comments here below. All right, let's get into the meat of it. What is teshuva and repentance? It literally means to return to turn back towards God, to restore, refresh. How many need refreshment out of there? How many, how many of you need to, you feel like you need restored? Like, you, like you're like almost old in, in the idea of you feel rusty, you don't feel fresh anymore. You need God to restore your joy. This is the word uh, that you need then, is this word shuv or teshuva is designed to bring refreshment. It's designed to restore you. It says to repair. Do you feel broken? It will repair. How about put back? This, Satan took whatever from you and put it over here. God says, look, if you will follow the he ancient Hebrew concept of shuv and returning, it, God, I will make him put it back, right? And also, I love this one. It says to give in payment to bring back. This is the definition of redemption. God gave his only begotten son and made a payment against the decrees that were written against us, the sin, and it did what? It brought us back. Once you make payment, which is connected to shuv, returning, repentance, we'll talk about that. When you make that payment, instantly there is a returning of what's been stolen to, from you and there is a bringing back. And I also love this, re repel and defeat. All these words are connected to teshuva. Did you know this? That when you shuv properly, when you have proper returning, biblical repentance, God re uses that to repel the enemy. The enemy hates repentance because he never did it. You see, he fell from grace. He was the highest angel. He wanted something that wasn't his, wasn't designed for his. He was not content. How many of us get in a position where we get in trouble because we're not content? I know that I, uh, in my own life, uh, have fallen into great sin because I wasn't content in my life. Most adulteries are because people aren't content, right? When we repent, the devil hates repentance because repentance brings you the power of refreshment, of restoration, of turning back and bringing God on your side. And that scares him to death. It repels him and it crushes him. And ultimately, it defeats him. That one Hebrew word, brothers and sisters, means all of that. So in Christianity, the word repent is, we always say it's walking this way. And to repent is to turn 180 degrees and walk this way. I get that. But that is not the Hebrew definition. It leaves it so empty and shallow and short of its real destination to the heart of the individual to set them free. If we're going to truly be set free, we must know and bear the truth because the truth is the only thing going to set us free. Not half the truth, not three quarters of the truth, all of the truth, my friends. And so as we walk through here, I pray that God will set you free with a new idea of repentance that you didn't quite really fully maybe believe or understand or even know before. And last but not least, it means to be returned, to be restored, and to be brought back in past tense. So not only is God doing all these incredible things through this, but when it's all said and done, you will be brought back. What's been stolen from you, the enemy will be forced to give back with interest, but you must follow the protocol of teshuva. The first time it's mentioned in scripture is Genesis chapter 3 verse 19. Read it with me. 
It says, in the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. That word return is shuv. It's to return. It's, it's connected to repentance. And I love the, the law of first precedence and biblical uh, hermeneutics, the study of the Bible. It says the first time a word is used really sets the precedence for what it's supposed to connect to. And returning, repentance is coming back to the ground. It's recognizing that you are nothing, that all of what you do is connected to original sin, and we will return to the dust. So return now before you are laid into the dust. Return in the spiritual sense so that you may be resurrected from it when you're there. What teshuva is not is saying you're sorry. It's not just saying you're sorry. And this is the problem. Now is when everything changes from this moment of the message forward is when everything changes. Teshuva or repentance is not just apologizing. And especially in Western thought, repentance is saying, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done that. No, that's not repentance in God's book. We're going to go through the four steps and even five. Uh, but the four steps of repentance and of teshuva and what it looks like here in just a moment. But I can assure you, if you stop short at just apologizing, the relationship won't get healed and that scar will be there. It will be brought back up and the enemy will water that seed until it grows another harvest. So let's talk about the four steps of teshuva right now. Here we go. Step number one, recognize that you have breached the covenant. We're going to talk all about these in detail. Number two, regret your actions. Number three, repent to others. And number four, restore and repair the damage. Stick around to the very end because I'm going to give you the fifth one, which is by far the most important and most exciting in my opinion. And I'll share that one at the very end. But for now, the four steps are again, recognize, regret, repent, and restore. So let's break these down one at a time. And this is where we're going to learn a little bit about the Hebraic power uh, that, that is in the scriptures when we go back to the original language and let it tell us what it means. Number one, recognize that you've breached the covenant. Read it with me. Matthew 5, 23 says this, therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. How many times have we had issue with our brother or sister and we just ignore it. I can't tell you as a pastor for many years how many people, even leadership, strong believers, will have issue with another brother or sister and they won't bring it to them. It's, oh, it's just not my personality. I'm an introvert. There's nothing in here that gives us excuse not to go to our brother in love and say, hey, can I share a feeling with you? When you did this, it hurt my feelings. I could be wrong. Maybe I'm missing some information, but but this is how I feel. There's nothing in there that gives you the right to hold on to that. And you know what Satan's almost number one tactic is? Is to convince you that it's it's not even a big deal. That you're not really offended. Oh, you're offended. And every little thing can become a very big deal because they always add up. The moment you become offended and you don't deal with it, the moment that you'll start looking at that person a little bit differently, and then the next time that they do something that might not even be an issue, it becomes another small issue and all of those add up and then the enemy does the proverbial straw that breaks the camel's back. Let's go to Romans 7, verse 7, see what it says as well. It says, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have even known sin except through the law. For I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, you shall not covet. So how do we recognize that we've breached the covenant One of the ways that we recognize we breached the covenant is reading the Bible, reading the law of God. It was God's law originally that set the boundaries of right and wrong, what we could do, what we couldn't do, all for our best interest, by the way, blessings and curses, right? Blessings if you keep my commandments, curses if you don't. So when we breach God's law, we know it because we read it and we know that we broke God's law. You can you can absolutely breach a covenant and not even know it. If you're married, you know this, that you can break one of your wife's Torah laws, instructions, and not even know that it was a law, but you can tell by the look on her face when you got home. You did something, right? Like when I come home and we have a little dog 
And whenever she's got her tail between her legs and she won't even look at me, I don't even know how it happens, but she knows she did something wrong and she's feeling guilty. How does a dog feel guilty? I have no idea. Proof that I guess all dogs do go to heaven or at least they have a soul because they've definitely got a conscious for sure. And I find out that she's been in the trash or, or something uh, other than that. But it, look, here's where we're going with this. Number one, we've got to recognize if you don't know that you're a sinner, you don't even need a savior. If you don't realize that you've done something wrong, you'll never get to the to point two or three or four and definitely not point five that we're going to go over today of the laws of teshuva. We must first know you're a sinner. Like an alcoholic, the number one rule is he must admit that he's an alcoholic. And the way that we do that is by reading his word is one of the ways. Now, some signs that you've breached the covenant. Someone comes to you and says that they're offended. If you find out that someone is offended, you've broken the covenant. Whether you, you did it intentionally or maybe they're misunderstood, it doesn't matter because emotions are legal and emotions are always right. That doesn't mean that they originated uh, from something, from a logic or reason that's right. They could very well be misinterpretation, but the feeling is real. So maybe you actually didn't do anything wrong to offend that person, but though they interpreted something that you did and their emotions are going with their reality. What we try to do is defend ourselves and, and, and try to convince that person of the logic rather than caring about the emotion first. You see, there's two languages uh, and every human being has. It's the language of logic and it's the language of the heart or emotion. If someone is operating in a language of emotion and you try to use the language of, of the mind, you'll always have a disconnect and the, and the argument will just continue. There's no rest, rest, restoration whatsoever. First, go into the heart realm, care about the feeling, regardless of whether or not you meant it or not. And once they feel that you care, you can fill in the missing information. There's a lot that can be said on conflict resolution. That's not what this video is about, but that's one way that you can know that there's a breach of covenant. Someone tells you. Christ cared more. This is a good statement. Christ cared more about making the relationship right than he did about defending the accusations against him. Did you hear that, my friends? I know, I don't know about you, but I am definitely a person who does not like to be falsely accused. I've been very falsely accused in a lot of areas of my life. Some of it I deserve because of, of my attitude and how I respond. But early on in my marriage, for sure, but God showed me one time in his word, just, I don't even know how I didn't see it. Jim, just get up on the cross. My son did it. He went to the cross. He didn't say a word. He was falsely accused too. Why do you feel like you have to defend yourself all the time? Sometimes you just have to do the right thing to make the relationship right. It ain't about being right. It's about doing the right thing. Amen. All right. Another way, another sign that you can know that you broke the covenant is what? You feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit. You feel it. You know you've done something wrong. That's the Holy Spirit saying you've got to now deal with it. The problem is we've not been told how to deal with it. So we feel this conviction. We carry it sometimes with us our entire life. It turns into guilt. It turns into shame. It turns into shackles around your feet and your hands. It paralyzes you and puts you into an emotional prison because we've not been taught how to deal with conviction or repentance. We don't know what it's like to return. What is it like to have teshuva, to repent? What is it like to be free? Truth my friends, will set you free. And lastly, a sign that you've breached the covenant. You're not experiencing the blessings that the covenant offers, whether earthly or spiritual. So if you're not receiving the blessings that God promises in his word, blessings if you keep his, you're probably not keeping his commandments because God promises blessings when you do Bible things in Bible ways. So don't make any excuses. That doesn't mean you're going to be rich. It doesn't mean you're going to always be happy. But it means that you will always have peace in your life when you are walking in covenant. Peace is not relative or connected to someone else following God. You might have a spouse that's not following God. Yes, it's easier to have peace if you're living in a house where someone else is following God. But it's not dependent on it. Yeshua had perfect peace in his life all the time. 
He chose to get away, connect with his heavenly father, and recenter that focus so that the world around him did not shake him, never got him off his square, as they say. So number one, recognize that you are in breach of the covenant. Number two, regret your actions. This is huge, my friends. I cannot express to you how important this is. That Hebrew word for regret is naham. Naham means to be sorry, to be moved to pity or compassion, and it means to comfort or console. So let's break this down for a little bit. Most of the time when we know that we've broken God's word, what we try to do is defend ourselves and try to make ourselves look better than we really are. I've done it. You've done it. We've all done it. Every one of us. There's not a person listening to this broadcast right now that, 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 that can throw a stone at, at, at someone else and say that you've done repentance perfectly. No, we have not. There's been a lot of sin in our lives that are hidden, skeletons, right? And at the end of the day, what happens? If we don't have true, godly sorrow, we never are allowed to be forgiven. Let me say that again. You can know you're in breach of the covenant. You can actually be sorry and apologize. You can even give rest restoration, restitution. You can do all of that. But if there was never real regret that, that is felt in the soul, then your heart was never there to begin with and you're just going through the motions. Therefore, you can never have point number five, which we'll get to at the very end. Naham also means when there's true godly sorrow, there is, it means to comfort or console. So when, when God says, I, I regret making man, right? He, he comfort himself. He comforted himself in that process. So there is a consolation and a comfort when we truly have that understanding of the depth of the action that we made. There is a comfort in feeling sorry. Isn't it a strange paradox? Have you ever really felt guilty for something and regretted it and it broke your heart and there was something beautiful and comforting about that? Have you ever cried yourself to sleep so bad and then it, like somehow you just felt better? You just need to get a good cry, right? I, I'm a firstborn perfectionist and I'm, you know, out and going 110 miles an hour and a lot of people you know, think I'm, you know, this or that, but I'm a sensitive person and sometimes I just need to go cry. The pressure of life is just too much sometimes and I need to let it out and it feels comforting. It's this strange paradox that we all live in. I love the, even the Greek word. I don't, I'm not a big Greek fan. I love Hebrew, but sometimes Greek has a phenomenal uh, just twist and a very pinpoint like a rifle accuracy uh, to what I believe God is really trying to say. The Greek word here for regret is metanoia, and it means to change one's mind, to go beyond your thinking, to be converted toward a different behavior. This is in incredible, my friends. This is showing that not only do you have godly sorrow, but real regret of your action will change your mind. In other words, we're so good. Have you ever experienced this, that you make a mistake and you very well might have made a mistake, right? You, you, you offend your spouse or you offend somebody, you do something wrong, maybe you break a law, I've been there, and, and then the, you did do something wrong, but then what they did to you was so over the top to what you did to them, you can't even see your sin anymore because all you're focused on is what they did to you. And you've made a judgment call that their sin is greater. We've been there. I've been there. In my own circumstances of what I went through, and many of you know exactly what I'm talking about, in my prison experience of what happened to me, I know that I fell into that trap of not looking at my own sin because of the sins that were committed against me in the process. That blinds us to seeing the truth about the depth and the depravity and the weight of our own sin, as if this sin is greater than this sin. The Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. When we sin, we deserve death. So why do we look at our neighbor and say, you deserve death? 
I didn't do that much. I did a little bit. I, yeah, I did do some, but what you just said to me was way bigger than what I said to you. And we, we stop condemning ourselves because we, because we feel justified that someone else's sin is bigger than ours. The reality is, is that Christ died for our sin. Yeah, he died for your neighbor, but at, on judgment day, it's very much like Catholic, uh, Catholic school. There is a priest in the confession and a curtain, and it's just you. When you get before God, it's just him and you. There's no curtain. It's face to face. You're going to be melted to the ground because of the smallest sin. Because God doesn't deal with sin very well. He can't let it into his heaven because heaven is perfect. That's why the blood of Christ is, 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 is so needed for us today. He returned to us so that we could return to him. Let us stop pointing the finger at somebody else's sin and let us look at our own sin because when we only look at our own sin, it will change your mind and your thinking about that person's sin. Let God deal with that other person. Focus on what you did. Make it right between you and him. This only happens when we put ourselves aside and look through the lens of someone else. Lastly, I think this is important. You do what you believe. We always do what we believe. So if we believe someone else's sin is greater, we will never likely repent of our own. This is why relationships rarely ever get restored. Is one or both parties are so egotistically driven by their own justification of their own actions and their own self-righteousness that the other person's sin is greater, that neither one of them humble themselves and say, you know what, I was sinned against, but I'm standing before God and I need to do the right thing. I need to humble myself as if they never sinned against me and I was the only one that made a mistake. I must treat the situation that way. And when you do, and you will only see your sin, you will be left with one single choice. Repent and return and make it right. And that's what we're talking about right now. Information only comes from two sources. Your mind can only be changed by information. And the information comes from either man, someone coming to you, and you find out uh, that, that, that maybe your offense was not even legitimate because you're missing information. You assumed that this person did something, so you judged them in the process I have felt certainly that judgment in my life when I was not allowed to talk about uh, what happened in my case, in my life, and people judged me without any information or with limited information or not with all the information, and it hurts. And when you give them the rest of the information, many times they change their judgment. So information is important. That's why we always assume that we're missing information. If you get an argument with your spouse, this is how you want you should start it out. I could be wrong. Write this down. This is the part you need to write down. It's not in a PowerPoint. Write it down. I could be wrong. This is how I feel about what, what just happened. Can you help me understand? I could be wrong. This is how I feel. Can you help me understand? If you remember those three things, It'll save you so much relationship problem because you'll be coming to the person assuming you might be wrong. And many times, relationship conflict is built off of miscommunication. It's built off of misunderstanding. We don't really try to get all the information first before we bring the hammer down. And then secondly, from God, the Holy Spirit, the Bible. That's new information. We read the Bible, we realize we're in sin, uh, and, and, and then we repent. That's why we need to be in the Word. So here we go. Number three, we've already talked about number, number one, number two, and number three. Number one was what? Recognize that we're in breach of the covenant. Number two, regret and the, and the importance of feeling that godly sorrow. And then number three, repent and confess. Once you understand what you've done and you only focus on your side of the street and you're going to clean up your side of the street regardless of the other person, or maybe it's with God, and you have that, that regret, man, why did I do that? Really hurt this person. I hurt him so much that, that they had to come over the top of me and hurt me worse. 
Now is when you confess. Now is when you really repent and confess. Read with me Proverbs 28, verse 13. It says, He who covers his sins will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Do you hear what that said, my friends? If we confess our sins, He's not only faithful to forgive us, but He will do what? Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Don't you feel dirty when you sin? That guilt, that shame, that, the mistakes, that you, the, the, the skeletons in the closet, the secrets, washes it all away. This is the gospel broken down in daily bread. When we repent, it, it, it daily it's like getting saved all over again. It's that moment of refreshment, cleansing. The conscience is cleansed. Total cleanness, all unrighteousness, gone. We need to live in that place. Or the devil will continue to sow seeds of discord in your life, in your family, in your community, your church, a nation. I love this verse. James chapter 5, verse 16 says, Confess your trespasses to one another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. What's this saying, my friends? Man, don't be prideful. You know, this idea of, hey, whatever happens in our house stays in our... Man, confess your sins to one another. When you mess up, just confess it. Go straight to that person. Confess what you've done wrong. Matthew 5, 23 says this, If you bring, therefore, your gift to the altar, remember that your brother is something against you, Leave your gift at the altar. Go make things right with your friend. First be reconciled. We already read this verse, but it's so worthy to read it again. Don't go before God when you've broken covenant with man. He won't hear you. What part of this do we not understand? We got the blessings of the covenant stop the moment that there is a breach in covenant. If you've done something wrong publicly, you must publicly repent. If you've done something to someone privately, you must privately repent. God will not go further until you do. He says, man, leave it there. I get it that you want to give me a blessing. I appreciate it, but I don't, I don't need it right now. Go make things right with them. That's the best sacrifice you could ever make. It's a real sacrifice to humble yourself and to do the right thing. The Matthew Protocol, we've all heard of the Matthew Protocol. Matthew chapter 18, verse 15 through 17, let's read it. Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. But if he will not hear, take with you one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. If he refuses even to hear the church, let him, to be, like, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. I'm not going to go through all the details of what this means. I'm going to give you a 30-second thumbnail because this set of scriptures has been radically misused and abused even by uh, pastors, bishops, uh, people that, 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 that claim to, to follow the whole book. This is a guideline, not a commandment. Okay. In other words, the heart of God is restoration. So there is a, a protocol here for how to get it, or at least the best uh, modus operandi to get there. And the first issue that you have to do is go to your brother. Be honest. Be loving. Let him know what's going on, and hopefully he hears you. And in and, and my experience is if that doesn't happen, try it again. If, if that person doesn't want to talk to you, find someone that they respect, not bringing somebody with you, you know, I'm walking out Matthew 18. That's not the spirit of, restor of restoration or Christ. Find someone they respect and bring them. Say, hey, man, we care about you. Can we talk? And maybe they'll hear them. Do it. I don't care how many times until they curse you out and, and tell you to leave them alone. Your job is to cover their sin and do everything in your power to help them see what their blind spot is because that is the love of Christ. That's what he did for us. Otherwise, he would have came and he would have died or he would have killed everybody on day one after they sinned. Adam and Eve would have been over with. None of us would be here today. But his long suffering, his patience, his love for us 
gives us time and time and time again to repent. Why are we as human beings that say we love God so unlike God that when people hurt us, we cut them off, we hurt them back, we gossip about them, slander them, judge them, condemn them, and never want to have anything else to do with them just because they had a blind spot. Real love, real friendship, real godly image bearer says that person's got a blind spot. Yeah, they're being mean right now, but I'm not going to divorce them. When our kids mess up and are all angry and talk back, we don't kick them out of the house, do we? No, we have patience. We love them. We try to give them instruction. We do whatever we can to bring their emotions down, turn the brain on, and help them reason and see that this is not how we act as brothers and sisters in Christ. We need to have more love for one another, brother. More patience. Go to them. And then eventually, it doesn't mean go and tell the entire church. See, the, the church gossip loves this verse because they say, hey, I, I tried it. I didn't do anything. I'm telling it everybody at the church. I'm putting it in the bulletin. No. It means, if you want to know the, the truth, it means go to the elders who represent the church. Have a bait in, which is a biblical trial. And if that person fails in that trial and they do not repent after witnesses come, to let them know what's going on and what really happened, then they're to be excommunicated because of rebellion. Not because of their sin, it's rebellion because they wouldn't repent of their sin. You skip this process of a bait din and a trial, you cannot excommunicate anybody from a congregation. That's not how it works. That's, that's a whole other story, but it's important that we go to our brother with the purpose of restoration. That's the heart here. Be honest when you approach that person to confess. Be thorough. Don't leave anything out. You don't want to have to come back later and say, you know, I kind of said this, but I didn't tell the full truth. No, tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Do not leave anything out. Tell the truth as if God was actually telling the truth for you because he wouldn't leave anything out. Just say it how it is, my friends. Be humble. And lastly, be patient. Why be patient? Because here's most often what happens. I do a lot of marriage counseling, and I, I can tell you, even in my own marriage, when there is an offense and you confess your sin, many times the other person has now got throw up all over them from your sin. You feel a lot better from throwing up uh, your confession, but now they respond because they're triggered uh, of whatever you just said in your confession, and they're likely to not respond the right way. Be patient with them. Understand that you hurt them. Give them time to work through their feelings, my friends. And, and validate their feelings. Validate that it hurts. And you'll always know if someone's truly repentant because the regret, the naham, the feeling of sorrow allows them to be patient because they recognize, you know what, I deserve this. Whatever response that you're giving, I deserve it. I hurt you. I'm so deeply sorry for letting you down. Patience is important. So number one, recognize that you're in breach. Number two, regret and have that deep sorrow. Number three, number three is repent and confess to that person. Be honest. Number four, restore and repair the breach. I'm going to go over five here in a minute, so stick with me because it's important. But number four is restore and and repair the breach. Now, this is something in traditional Christianity that's really not talked about. It's one of the biggest key missing pieces of real repentance is bringing in the temple system. It's understanding the front of the book and what re repentance and restoration and returning to God looked like. What does uh, repentance look like in the Old Testament? If you sinned, it cost you something. You couldn't just tell God, hey, God, I'm really sorry about that. Or, apologize for that. No, it cost you a sheep. It cost you five goats. It cost you a turtle dove or a pigeon if you're poor. It cost you something of value. You were going to pay for your sin, quite literally. Now you might say, well, we're under the new covenant, Jim. Are you suggesting that we sacrifice a goat? No. What I'm suggesting is the pattern is that payment must be made. For all is sin and fallen short of glory of God, Romans 3.23. And the wages and the payment of that sin, Romans 6.23, is death. Something must die. 
Now, Christ took that. No question. On the issue of sin, Christ was the payment. But the principle is, when you mess up, you must come before God. First, go before your brother, if it's dealing with your brother, and you must make restitution. You must do what's right. Exodus 22 and Numbers 5 deal with restitution and what that looks like and giving back this many sheep or this many goats. And again, we're not giving goats and sheep back to people. That's an agricultural and a a cattle-based society. So that's why they're... It's the principle of restitution. If you you take something from your neighbor on purpose and you stole it uh, with the intention of stealing it, you got to give so much back. So in some cases, 400% back. Some cases, 20% more. In some cases, you don't have to do anything if there was accidents involved. At the end of the day, it's important that you restore and repair the breach on the level that whoever you hurt, whether it's God or man, and in case of man, it will be God, it will be both, according to Scripture, you need to find out what can you do. What can you ask your spouse, ask that person, what can I do to make it right? In some cases, you can't make it right. You destroyed uh, something. You broke their heart in a way that there's no way to repair that breach. We'll talk about that in just a moment. But it's very, very, very important that you understand the entire temple system is about making restitution and doing what's right to make it right. See, God was never interested. Listen to this next statement, my friends. God was never interested in their sacrifices. It was, the, it was the, the, the clean hands and a pure heart and the heart of faith that was holding the ram or the lamb or the goat that was obeying God by faith, that he believed that God would forgive him if he gave of the best of his flock to ask forgiveness for his sin. It was the faith coupled with obedience that brought redemption and forgiveness and restoration. It was never the animal. The animal was just a placeholder to give him a protocol to bring his faith before God. This is what tithing is all about. If you're not tithing, if you're not giving to the kingdom of God, you're you're failing in the sacrificial system that says you cannot come before me empty-handed. The tithing is just the symbol. It's the, it's, the, it's, the, it's the object that God uses to prove your faith. It's coming before God to say, I'm giving you what you gave me. I'm sacrificing something that I need because I believe in you that you can take care of me in greater ways. It's just faith. You think God needs money? God doesn't need cattle. He never needed money today. He doesn't need cattle back then. What he's looking for is faith and obedience mixed together. Sometimes you can't make it right, like I said. Sometimes there's no way to make it right. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For by grace you've been saved through faith, and it's not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Sometimes, just like with our own sin, there's nothing you can do to make it right. You've broken the covenant, you can't make it right, and you have to rely on grace. Look, man, when somebody does something that hurts you, when somebody comes to you in a broken heart and asks forgiveness, they may not be able to fix it. They may have run over your dog. They may have burned your house down, metaphorically or physically. They may have run over something in your life that can't, they can't give it back. This is the moment of the gospel message for that person. Don't hold it over their head for the rest of their life. Don't get out your your stones and a bucket of stones or your, your ammo for your gun and just start shooting. God says, look, bank on my grace in those moments. It's sufficient for you. None of us can do anything about the the sin that we created. We destroyed the very image of God through our own sin. Every one of us deserves death. We have to rely on the grace of God. The blood of the Messiah is the only thing that covers our sins and a contrite heart that accepts the blood where the power comes. And that leads me to number five. The moment I believe all of us have been waiting for. What I'm about to say next in this fifth point is what every single one of us are waiting for. 
We just don't know how to get there. We strive every single day for what I'm about to say, and we can't find it. Some people find it in other women, uh, uh, another spouse, a lover, an affair, drinking the bottle, alcohol, drug, whatever it is, because we can't fulfill and find this one word that our soul is looking for every single day. That's why I did the, the, the teaching on, on, on how to share the gospel last week. Sadly, one of the least watched teachings that I've done all year. We, it should be the most popular teaching. Because if we don't know the gospel, we don't know how to share it. If we don't care about growing the kingdom of God, then we might not even be saved. Because everyone is in a place, the unsaved is looking for the same thing that we are. And you know what it is? It's peace. So the fifth and most important, when you follow all four of the protocols for Teshuvah, we recognize that we broke the covenant. We regret making those decisions. We repent and confess our sins to one another so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, right? And the fourth one was what? Restore the breach, restore and repair what you've stolen. Restore and repair the breach. When you do all four of those, number five is automatic. It's receive the reward of peace. It's the water to your souls. Acts 3.19 says, repent therefore and be converted. That word there is is is, is in Hebrews to shuv. It's return. It's change your mind. Therefore, return that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. It's the refreshment of being in His presence. It's the forgiveness of sins. It's really, ultimately, peace. It's shalom in Hebrew. That's what we're looking for. And that's what you get when we truly return to him. 2 Corinthians 7.10 and we'll end. For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. You see, when we have true godly sorrow, it leads to repentance, which leads to salvation, the refreshment, the returning of our souls to where they need to go. So in Conclusion, the four steps to Teshuvah are what? Recognize that you've breached the covenant. Regret your actions. Repent to others and confess your sins with great detail and honesty. Restore and repair the damage in every way that you possibly can. Go above and beyond. And number five, most important, receive the reward of peace. Because once that happens and you've done those four things and you've walked out that protocol, then you need to follow this last scripture, which says this, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. That's Philippians 3.13, my friends, and I'll leave you with this. True to Shuva, True returning, true repentance in God's eyes cleans you to such a degree He doesn't even remember your sins. Psalms 103.12 says, As far as the east is from the west, so far has He removed our transgressions from us. When we truly repent and we feel that, re that, that regret and we confess our sins with our mouth, He's faithful, He's just, to forgive us of our sins, refreshing comes. He doesn't even remember them anymore, so why should you? Stop going back to your past. Let it go. Now, if the past is haunting you, then God might be convicting you that you need to do something about it. It doesn't matter. There's no such thing as, oh, water under the bridge. No, the water never stops running under the bridge in that analogy. Have you ever wondered that? Until you get rid of it, that water is going to constantly be flowing, bothering you. Maybe you need to go back to somebody that you've hurt 30 years ago. Make it right. Do what's right and let God bring refreshment to you.
My friends, thank you for joining me in this broadcast here at Passion for Truth. My name is Jim Staley. I look forward to seeing you in the next video.